Well, good afternoon and welcome to this, the seventh episode in the Stuart Soundbites webinar series. Um, I'm delighted to have joining me today, Laura Bockholtz. Uh, Laura is a chartered physiotherapist specializing in treating patients with spinal cord injuries. Uh, she's practiced in that area since 1993 and she's worked at a number of amazing hospitals, including Stoke Mandeville, RNOH Stanmore and the Royal Buckinghamshire Hospital, to name but a few. She's worked as an expert witness since 1999 and receives instructions on behalf of both claimants and defendants. Laura's here to talk about warm water therapies and the issues and evidence she considers when giving her opinion to the court as to whether the claimant reasonably requires access to them. So without further ado, Laura, I have some questions here for you and if we can run through them. Um, the first one is, I hear a lot of jargon um, when I speak about warm water therapy. Um, I hear aqu aquatic therapy, hydrotherapy, warm water exercise. Could you give me an explanation as to what the differences are? Yes, I, um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's quite complicated, especially if you're not working in the field and everybody get, tends to get muddled up with a different variation of the word. So if we start with hydrotherapy and aquatic therapy, the beginning of the word hydro is come from Greek and aquatic is Latin, but both set means the same thing, which is basically water. Then you've got the second part of the word, which is therapy. So that implies that the water is used um, for therapeutic purposes and therefore in general you have a therapist and mainly a physiotherapist who is going to do something quite clever in the water with the client. Finally it also implies that there is um, that, the, that the water is warm so we're talking about between 32 and 35 degrees. In general people talk about hydrotherapy pool and aquatic physiotherapy so it's quite complicated. I what I tend to do is I like uh, throwing a spanner in the works and what I do is I talk about exercise in water and the reason why I talk about exercise in water is because then I can be more specific and I, I can uh, talk about warm water or less warm water and then I can just decide if we need a professional or somebody trained to do that. So as experts, like you said, we need to provide an opinion and therefore we need data. And that's where the, the, the teamwork starts. So it's not just um, me, the expert, but is the solicitor, is the client, is the therapist treating. And then we need to work together to try to understand and gather data to find out if aquatic therapy, exercise in water is um, necessary, necessary and reasonable. The question is, what the individual needs, do they need warm water, do they need normal water, do they need a therapist, do they, can they do it on their own or they can, can they have somebody else doing it with them? Okay, thank you. Um, because you, you've talked about warm water there or normal water, Just, is there a benefit from the warm water actually being warm? And if there is, what sort of benefits would you expect to see somebody with a spinal cord injury receive from warm water? So the benefits of water are, are several and it's a great way to provide therapy and to provide exercise for people with a spinal cord injury. So what, would, what we can achieve is at the beginning especially um, and, and related to warm water is a reduction in spasm, a reduction in uh, pain and a reduction in uh, and an improvement in joint range. So the reason why uh, water works for, um, for those purposes is because we can mainly access the trunk. And if you think about the trunk, people are sitting in the chair all day, uh, but then in the water, we can access the trunk 360. There is the, the buoyancy, there is, the, the, uh, the, the, there is no gravity. So it's much easier for us as therapists to, to get hold of that trunk. And by getting hold of that trunk, stretching it, uh, twisting it and strengthening it, then will have an effect on, um, on pain, spasticity and range. And in that case, warm water is quite important because spasticity tend to reduce um, in warm water. Joint range is easier to stretch in warm water because you're more relaxed and the pain, it has also an effect on the pain. 
Now, we can, we can also use um, water to improve strength by using the resistance of the water. We can promote function by using the buoyancy of the water. So there is a lot of pro uh, properties of the water that we can use. We can also challenge the balance and the gait um, by creating turbulence around um, uh, the person. So it's more difficult for them to stay upright and therefore we are challenging balance. It's easier, if they are not scared, it's easy to get them out of the base of support and therefore we can make them fall and they are not scared. So it's a way of, uh, of uh, challenging their balance without being on the floor and hurting themselves. It's a good way of improving fitness as well. And um, because, we are, because if they've got the ability to move their arms and their legs by moving both at the same time, then you create a better cardiovascular uh, activity. And then obviously you can promote quality of life and leisure and activity with others. So in general, water needs to be warmer if you are not very active in the water. That's the reason why aquatic therapy started, because people who are not very active after their injury, they come into the water. If you get them in cold water, then they're going to be cold and they need to get out. Also, people with spinal cord injury have got difficulty re uh, regulating their temperature. So we also need um, warm water. Um, it will relax people and therefore it will be a positive experience and it will again have an impact mainly on pain and spasticity and well-being. Now if you want to exercise and exert yourself, uh, you know, if like we want to um, get stronger in the water or uh, get our heart rate, then warm water is less essential because obviously if you exercise, you're going to sweat and therefore you don't necessarily want hot water, you want cooler water. So again, it's finding out what's best for them. What I would say is that in the acute phase, warm water is much better because they because it's uh, nicer for them to use. And then in the long term, what we're trying to do is to promote, uh, to promote the reduction in, on dependency of warm water. Do they actually need it or not? So if they need it, yeah, we need have to carry on. If they don't need it, then we'll give them more freedom to access other facilities as opposed to just an, uh, uh, you know, a hydrotherapy pool, which is five, 50 miles away from them sort of thing. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, so I think I've covered that bit. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, I mean, just moving on to your role as a, a court expert and reporting to the court, um, can you explain the importance of evidence uh, to you when you are forming your opinions on the benefits of aquatic therapy? I mean, what sort of evidence do you actually look for and need to help you form your opinion? So we talked about all the, all the long list of what um, warm water can do for a client. The problem, and we, we, what we need to decide then is what can, how can they improve in their strengths or how can they improve in their spasticity or how can they um, improve uh, in different areas. So the next step would be to just figure out what are they, what can they use for that. So there is a lot of different options. So there is hydrotherapy pools I've already spoke about, there is hot tubs, there is bath, there is a normal swimming pool, there is the use of jets of floats and weights. So we need to choose which one would work for them. And that's where we need data, because I can I cannot say if a hot tub is going to be enough or they need a swimming pool or they need to or they need a hydrotherapy pool. So for me to take that decision, I need some data. Now, if they need to stretch and reduce pain and spasticity, you could say, OK, a hot tub or a bath could be sufficient. But is it really sufficient or not? Depends of their level of spasticity and pain. If they need to exercise and challenge their balance, it's probably better to have a bigger space and let one, but do they need the, the water to be as warm as a hydrotherapy pool? And then again, the pain, pain and spasticity is the more complicated um, thing to assess because obviously uh, it's, uh, it's an impair, uh, there are impairments that take into consideration a lot of different things. We need to talk about, about model, um, um, Sorry about medication, about their psychological state, about knowing where the pain comes from. So we can't really take aquatic um, access only uh, only as a as the only modality to sort out their problems. It's it's more complicated than that. 
So from a clinical point of view, going back to you know, working as a team, it's really important to gather that data. On one hand, as clinicians, we really want people to come through our doors to the clinic, have loads of clients who need aquatic therapy or physiotherapy, but we are not necessarily um, ready or, or, or very good at gathering the data. So it's all very nice if the, the client wants to come, he pays and that's it. But in this case, because we need to uh, decide if it's reasonable or not, we need to gather the data. And I've been involved in different cases um, and some have had better data than, than less, you know, and, and some less good data. I'll talk about um, uh, the, uh, the, the good data later because it's, um, because I wanted to um, uh, take some time with that. But for example, I had a lady who had a spinal cord injury, had a swimming pool, and the physiotherapist was going to the swimming pool for twice a week for the, la for the last two years. And I come in later in the case, and then the, the client obviously wants to pull at home and I'm just saying, okay, what can, you know, ha, what is the data? And we really didn't have any information about was is his spasticity better? Was his heart rate going up? We just didn't have anything. So for me, I can just anticipate as an expert and say, oh yes, I could, you know, he could do this. Um, and I assume he could do this and that would work for him, but my, my case is less strong, yeah? So going back to um, to being more positive, um, I just I just want to talk about this case. Um, Holly, do you mind putting the the slide? That's it. So this is a, a case of um, a lady who had a C6 uh, spinal cord injury, Asia B. So she had a lot of uh, sensory information coming in and her spasticity was really bad and she did not want to take medication. So I was the expert and I found a physiotherapist specialized in aquatic therapy and we discussed what was the problem and how to best um, address and find out how could we basically find out if exercise in water would work and what type of temperature that did she need it and how often she needed it. So we decided to do an assessment. And if you can see, you've got uh, the different weeks. So before we started the assessment, we asked her to have a diary um, and just uh, write information about her spasticity, where they interfere with us, with a transfer, where they interfere with the sleep, what were, what were the problems. And then we decided to make a, a comparison be between land therapy and then um, a water based therapy. So the first thing we had is we had five consecutive days of land therapy and that included stretches and standing. And if you look at the graph, right, we use the span frequency, um, uh, the pen, sorry, the pen spasm frequency scale. And you've got the severity and you've got the frequency. So you can see that on the first week, which is the blue, uh, she's, she she um, fluctuate between four uh, between four and three. So therapy does make a difference. Stretches does make a difference, but she's still at three um, on the level. So she still got quite strong uh, spasm. We have then the second week where she has a week of jacuzzi. So there is no much activity, but there is warm water. There is a, a, some improvement there, but again, it's not significant. When you look at week three, the, the five consecutive days of aquatic therapy, which included stretches, swimming and strengthening, then she maintained a very low. So she's at one on the spasticity level. So that is, um, that is a very uh, good outcome that we've had in that case. Now, what we wanted to know is if she needed to have access to warm water and activity and exercise and stretches in warm water every day to be able to stay like that. Or she could just get away with doing it on a Monday and a Thursday or three times a week or whatever. And that is week four where we've got the going up and down on the graph. So she's, she, she, has, she has some carryover, but then she goes back up in between the, in the sessions and then she goes back down again. So what is important is that we've answered a few questions, not all of them, but we knew that then warm water would work for her. We knew that she needed some movement in the water. She couldn't just lie in the water. And then we knew that if we wanted 
her to be without spasticity for a long time. She needed to do it every day, but she could get away with one or two days. For, for some people, um, it's likely that they need warm water like this lady, but what we need to find out is the why and the what and the how to be able to then use it in court and have a stronger case. Excellent. Well, that's, yeah. that's excellent. Well, thank you very much for explaining that about uh, warm water therapies and how you approach it from a, a court uh, point of expert perspective. Um, so uh, I hope uh, everyone out there listening uh, has found it as helpful and as informative as I have. Uh, if you'd like to re-watch this episode or you'd like to tell your colleagues about it, then it'll be posted on the Stuart's website tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions for either Laura or me about anything on this, um, then please do contact us. Uh, our website, uh, sorry, our emails will be on the um, posting tomorrow, or you can contact us via our respective firm's uh, website. Uh, next week's episode will be my colleague, Chris Smith, who's a senior associate at Stuart's, talking with Jamie Gillespie, a prosthetist and orthotist at Pace Rehabilitation, uh, in providing continual care for amputees during COVID. So once again, thank you very much, Laura. Thanks for watching. Uh, we hope you found it interesting. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Enjoy your day. You too. Bye. Bye.